And welcome back to Green Mountain Mornings on WKVT 100.3 FM AM 1490, Brad Bros News Talk Station. It is 30 degrees out there and 824 on this Tuesday, December 19th. I'm your host, Olga Peters, and I have in the studio with me Chris Mays from The Reformer. Welcome, Chris. Thanks. And this segment is also being filmed by... Brattleboro Community Television, which broadcast of Green Mountain Mornings tonight on BCTV is sponsored by the Brattleboro's Brattleboro Savings and Loan. And you can also find this segment later today on their website, brattleboro.tv. Without further ado, ado, Chris, tell me about the new body armor that the Brattleboro Police Department has just received. Um, Well, well, a bunch of um, three departments or agencies um, in the county just received new vests. It's part of, you know, a Senator Leahy um, program to, to make sure that all vests are replaced um, in a timely manner. They tend to expire within four or five years. But the Brattleboro Police Department, through a, a, a different grant, a Justice Assistance Program grant, um, they they they're getting uh, these things called a carrier, a cloth carrier, huh. and they're going to be able to shift um, some of the weight of their equipment up to their upper body instead of holding it on their belt. And um, Captain Mark Harrigan says it's going to be a huge health benefit for, for his officers. And, and it's also um, a, a workers' compensation issue, and it's something he thinks that other, other departments are going to be doing um, in the future. So help me understand, the cloth carrier, is that a special type of bulletproof vest, or is that in addition? That's in addition. Okay. Yeah, so they they can move some of the stuff like radios and and whatever else they have, you know, up to their chest. Because right now, most of the radios, the handcuffs, the handguns, they're all held on a On a belt. belt, yeah. And do police find that that puts pressure on their lower back, or? Yep, that's exactly right. And there's some sciatic nerve issues that can that can occur. And I realize you don't have the article right in front of you, so I might be giving you a pop quiz here. Do you happen to remember what the grants totaled? I actually we we didn't get the exact number on that one. No. And is it a federal grant that paid for the? Yeah, and it's gonna it's gonna benefit all the officers. It's gonna, yeah. Fantastic. Well, I hope I hope they uh, like the new, new cloth carriers. How about the Jamaica in Jamaica? They have a new and improved town garage. Tell us about that. Yeah, a town meeting annual town meeting in March. Um, voters approved a bond not to exceed seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and then some voters felt like they didn't have. Um, enough information so they had a revote and it hmm. was approved again so now six months later or so um, the garage is is built and it's it's amazing um, the the difference in from the old one to the new one it's about triple the size oh wow the old sit space um, was said to be unsafe and unhealthy for the workers and it was something that select board member alexa clark really wanted to see um get updated because she worried about the guys in there. So uh, did they build a whole new garage on a new site or? No, they took down the old garage and built it within the same footprint. And and they actually went without a garage for about six months. They used this old building next to it, which they said is actually a historic building. It was once a chair factory. Oh, wow. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Who knew Jamaica had chair factories? Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and so with this new garage, what are some of the things they've done to 
to m- mitigate some of the health problems of the old garage. Well, they have the vent- a new ventilation system. Um, sensors go off, and then you know the air gets um, taken out of the building. And then there's uh, radiant heat on the floor, so these these guys aren't working um, on wet floors. You know, sometimes they got to get under the trucks, and they'd get all wet, and you know they can get sick from from that. It's also not pleasant to stand on cold concrete all day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, and since it's bigger now, they can fit all their um, equipment. Sometimes they had to stuff things in there. Sometimes things would be out in the cold. And now they think they'll be able to preserve their equipment longer. Now, this, um, the cost of the, the garage, was that a bond? Did they pay through it through grants? It was um, a bond, so they're they're paying it back. Um, they don't know if they went over or under or hit that that mark yet. They're still doing some of the financials now, but they don't expect it was any big overage. Well, thank you, Chris. Yeah. And quickly, you had mentioned that there was a multiple break-ins in town, and it, police have made an arrest. Yeah, over the course of one day, several um, businesses downtown um, on Elliott Street were um, broken into and it wasn't until um the person went to um arkham a bar when they found some success and they they broke into the atm they they couldn't get any money out but it was still um significant damage to the atm machine and the door and when police caught up to the person they used surveillance video from uh, one of the businesses and uh, she admitted she had used a screwdriver which is what they had seen um to get into these build to get into these uh, businesses, and she said she wanted money t- to pay for lawyer fees. She had a family court case coming up, and she needed the money. So. Wow, that's a painful story. Yes, it is. Well, thank you for updating um, us, Chris. Chris and I will return after the break. Welcome back to Green Mountain Mornings on WKVT Brattleboro's News Talk Station at 100.3 FM, AM 1490. 30 degrees outside and 839 on this Tuesday, December 19th. I'm your host, Olga Peters, and thank you to Chris Mays from The Reformer for joining me today. Hi, Chris. Hi. So update us on the fire in Brookline. It was a fatal fire, as I understand it. Yeah, it was It was really tragic. Um, it was a two-alarm uh, fire with... Uh, yeah, one woman was entrapped in the building. Mm-hmm. Um, two other people were able to get out, but they had serious burns. They were taken to um, Massachusetts General Hospital um, for their injuries. And when firefighters arrived at the scene, they, they were not able to get the woman who was stuck in. She was 32 years old, and I believe um, she was she was blind you know, partially blind. Mm -hmm. And it was a family home, correct? It was a two-story cabin, yeah. Okay. Have uh, fire investigators, and we should note that in the state of Vermont, whenever someone is injured or dies in a fire, it automatically triggers an investigation into the fire. What have investigators found so far? Um, They said it's still early um, in early stages of investigation when I was at the scene and we haven't seen any update in, in terms of cause. Um, so yeah, we're on, we're looking for that. And so we don't know at this stage if it was um, an accident, if it was arson, if it was... No. No, yeah. we don't have any information. Yeah. How about on the folks who were transported to Boston? Do we have any updates on, on their health? Um. I've I've heard um, that that um, the woman seems to be in stable condition, and the and the and the man is um, still pretty seriously injured. Do we know how old they they are? Um, I'm not sure. They're they're you know over fifty, both of them, I believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And is that I don't know that that would add or help their condition or have you heard anything? Yeah. No, I don't know. Wish them the best. Yeah, it was really sad. The whole building was destroyed, and there was a barn right next to it that caught fire, and they had to move some animals to a house um, up the road. 
the animals were all okay, the firefighters were all okay, but it was definitely a sad day down in Brookline. Sometimes it's hard being a, an emergency responder. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how about going on to a slightly different topic? You mentioned that there is a new solar project in the area. Um, yeah, there's actually uh, two proposed in Wilmington this year. They'll still have to go through the state permitting process, but the select board has pretty much given um, an okay to both these projects. One of them was several months back, and it was in front of the um, development review board yesterday. And mm -hmm. that's for um, a site right next to um, a closed landfill at the oh, transfer okay. station. And then there's another solar site, a bigger one, being proposed on West Main Street. Oh, interesting. Where? where? Um, it's hard to describe, but it's, you won't be able to see it from the road. Mm -hmm. it's, it's in the back. And, um, you won't be able to see it from Route 9 either. So that's one of the things they're, they're saying. And they needed to get a, um, they needed the town to approve it as a preferred site. Um, to be eligible for all the benefits it could be, and and to and it would help them when they go in front of the um, utilities commission. I, it's going to be a net metering project. They've said that the town could to could come into it. It looks like it's going to be a community solar project where they're going to offer it to people in the town in the community first. But I think they want it to be larger off takers like businesses because they or maybe a group of residents um, come together because they're not big enough of a company to be, you know, you know, doing really small deals. They need to have the bigger businesses come in, I guess. Mm -hmm. And has this company done other projects in the state? Um, I'm not sure. I, I don't know of anything um, locally or in the state, but they have been um, in talks with the Hermitage Club but right now those plans are not going forward just yet, but there were our plans by Haystack Mountain to put up solar, and this company was um, you know, set to do that. Okay. So I think that they identified a site while they were in town, and, and they're moving forward with this one for now. Interesting, so stay tuned. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you. And you had mentioned, I know that this is um, a week or so old, but... Tell us about the Hermitage uh, Club and some issues with the fire department. Um, it's actually the fire district, fire district um, where you. they get their water and sewer from, the Cold Brook Fire District. And um, they were late in paying um, a bond payment. The district pays the bond for them, but the Hermitage Club is responsible for paying for it all because it was upgrades they needed. Mm -hmm. So... Um, they were late in paying the district, but the district covered um, the Hermitage Club. But they were threatening to take away sewer and water allocations, which are basically rights they right. have for um, you know f future development they have planned. And they were threatening to take those away. So the Hermitage Club ended up paying that that um, that within a couple of days of they were given a week to pay this this amount, and they did, and then. They've also said that if they don't pay their water and sewer bills by January 4th, they're going to shut off water and sewer um, at, at a bunch of their properties by Haystack. You know. huh. um, but the Hermitage Club said they plan to pay their obligations. And um, last week during the big snowstorm, uh, Jim, Jim Barnes mentioned that they had received 70% of this one, these one-time uh, due adjustments they were asking members to pay. Mm -hmm. And um, so that money was being collected to pay vendors and, and towns that, that are owed money. And the plan is, they, the idea is that once they have those people paid off, they can set out and get loans and, and financial um, things to, to begin their other projects. To start the next phase of, of development. Yeah. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that progresses. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you know how many years out the Hermitage Club is working 
on its its like how many phases it's it's got or um, what kind of timeline it's operating? I'm not sure how long the master plan is. I, I want to say it's like 15 years or something. Okay. And they they needed approval for that, and that took a long time, but it contained a bunch of projects. Right now, I know they've been kind of working to get some of their townhouses done. Mm-hmm. And there are, there's, there are plans to, to build this hotel by the mountain. Oh, nice. But we haven't heard much about that um, in a while, but I know that's kind of set in the future. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Chris. Yep. And we have a few minutes left. Tell me about, um, just for, for fun, because you're about to head out on vacation, tell us about the turtle that needed a new home. Oh, um, Basil was, um, he, he's outgrown his tank at the um, S- Southern Vermont Natural History Museum. Which is up on Hogback on Route 9. Yes, yeah. so they're, they're doing crowdfunding for their first time. Um, huh. on gofundme.com and and why would they need to resort to crowdfunding for a new tank for a turtle well because um funds are tight there mm-hmm. they actually have a bunch of projects they they have they call it a wish list you know and and this was one that you know needed to be done as soon as possible because he, he needs to be in a better habitat you know what kind of turtle is he he's a snapping turtle oh they get big yeah <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and they're and and when they're not happy, they're they're mean. I guess this <laughs> this guy's really um actually really nice and calm, and and he hangs out and and uh, he's not mean. That's why he can't go back out into the wild uh, because okay. he was um I guess he was taken by some kids as a pet illegally, mm-hmm. and then um a, a group in Bennington donated the turtle to the museum, and. And since then, he's just grown used to uh, humans. He's really friendly, and they said that it's um, that he, that he seems like he has no problems with dogs either. Oh, interesting. So, so it would be unsafe for him to go out yeah. into the wild. So he's one of the most popular education models, educational models at the museum. They go into schools, and so the kids and and teachers and all they they love this guy. This Basil, how old is he? Do you know? Um, I think he's he's over five years old. I I don't know the exact age, but they've had him for a few years now. Mm-hmm. They named him about three years ago, and they had him for a year or two before that. Okay, and is he the only animal at the museum, or do they have other? Oh, they have a few other animals. Yeah, such as um, they have an eagle. Oh, they, neat. a rescued eagle. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They have a few other animals. I'm not sure exactly. I haven't been there in a little while. Oh, fun. And how, like, have you seen Basil? If, like, is he the size of a dinner plate now? Is he the size of a, a sofa cushion? Like, no, I actually did the interview over the phone. It was on a snow, no, snowstorm. And oh, his yeah, measurements, you're not doing nine on a snowstorm. <laughs> yeah, his measurements are in the article. I just I forgot it up at the top of my head. That's okay. People can go to reformer.com and look for Chris's article on Basil the turtle to find out out more. Wonderful, Chris. Before I let you go, any uh, items or issues that you have planned for when you return in the new year? Um, Yeah, I'm working on a story about two retired doctors in the area, and they talk about their concerns about a shrinking workforce and... um, you know, a stressed system and an aging population and some of the ideas they are floating around to improve that. Fantastic. Uh, and I'm also, I also submitted a story. It should be published soon where I talked with some um, parents of adult children who are um, addicted to drugs. Uh, okay. And there's a video to go along with that. Our photographer, Chris Ratter, um, was part of that, yeah. Looking forward to to seeing that. That sounds like a really powerful piece. Yeah, I hope so. (laughs) Well, Chris Mays from The Reformer, thank you for being with me today. Thank you, Roland from VCTV, for filming and uh, wishing everyone a good rest of their day. 